Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones coming to you with part two in our four-part series on walls and the use of spray foam insulation. In part one we took a look at a 2x4 wall system uh, from before the turn of the century all the way up to the end of the 1970s. And now we're going to take a look at the primary method of framing today which is going to be 2x6 within North America. That has been the method of construction from the 1980s onward. You may have 2x4 still legal in your state or county, but in Canada 2x6 has been the uh, absolute default since the 1980s. The principal reason for this was not structure, it was to get a higher rated energy code in place to get the building consumption uh, down. Uh, they started to realize by the end of the oil embargo and the energy crises that came through in the 1970s that energy consumption was the new in thing and therefore better insulating values or higher R values must be the direction in which the industry had to go. So two inches was added on to the dimensional lumber to give the extra space for added insulation because arguably uh, three and a half inches of glass fiber was not cutting it. But what have they really solved? I mean, if you take a look at the principal giant or elephant in the room that we've had to take on since our inception in the spray foam industry, you have a product that from 1980 forward has claimed that at five and a half inches their product gets an R19. Then it became all of a sudden R20. Then it became R21. And then we've now competitively marketed that we're getting an R22. And with the newest high-density uh, bats that are on the market, all of a sudden we're R24. If you don't call a big pile of BS on all of that, then you might as well turn this video off and run to the store. Because I don't understand how a oxygen-based, air-insulated-based uh, open cell fibrous that is susceptible to air movement and water movement whether it's high density or not is able to drastically change the heat flow equation in the wall assembly in that amount of time I have a dedicated video that I'm not going to get into here because if I did this would no longer be a 2x6 wall video but I have a dedicated video to the myth of what R value is and you really need to maybe hit pause at this moment Go watch that video and then come back to this one because until you understand the fallacy that resistance value or conductivity testing is and how the codes have been based on a 33% of a 100% equation, you're going to be sort of at a disadvantage in this race of understanding the information that I'm going to present here in. The 2x6 wall stuffed completely full with whatever product you want, high density uh, glass fiber bat, rock wool, mineral fiber bat, I do not care. They do not perform drastically different than they were 40 years ago. The reason being is they're still using air to insulate with. They still need a 6 mil polyethylene vapor barrier or air barrier system. It's not just good enough to stop vapor. We have to stop the air. So the air has to be ceased from traveling through this product around all the electrical outlets, any penetration through the wall, any um, interior to exterior wall uh, junctions, roof and wall ceiling junctions. So you're starting to see by the early 1990s that our building codes were written for air barrier assemblies. And you might say, well, what is that? It's continuous, non-stop air film between the interior space and the exterior space. So you're seeing the framers lay down plastic between plates, between walls, around electrical outlets, so that when the fiberglass is done its installation into the edges and into the corners, the six mil polyethylene is put up. The reason it's six thousandths of an inch is that it needs to meet stringent air barrier properties and not tear and not easily uh, become destroyed. So although you could put a piece of cellophane up and that would satisfy the code for vapor diffusion, it will not satisfy the code for air uh, barrier properties. So we were getting a dual function, vapor control or vapor barrier and air barrier, hence why they call it an AVB. 
The most important thing going on here, keep the warm, moisture-laden air, because we're in Canada, we're in the heating mode 80, 80 to 82% of the time of the year. Keep the warm, moisture-laden air inside the building and not allow it to go through the wall assembly, through the fibrous insulation and come in contact with something that's cold enough to condense. That's the theory. Now, understanding one piece of information from the fiberglass batting is that when you go and rate theoretical laboratory resistance value tests or resistance values, this means that your fibrous product is in contact with all six sides of the box that it needs to insulate. So if we take a vertical wall assembly, it's in contact with the outside sheeting. It's in contact with all of the studs, both studs left and right on a 16 or 24 inch spacing. And that it's in contact with where the drywall is going to be, all six sides. Get this factor, a 4% gap, just a 4% gap in anywhere to the substrate, to the edges, to the sides, anywhere. A 4% gap accounts for a 30% reduction, that is right, 30% in that fibrous or mineral fibrous product uh, R value, resistance value. So the heat loss is going to go up by 30%, 30% with a 4% void. That's just with a void. And we all know that your cousin and your friend and your uncle and your buddy and the guy down the street and the guy that you found on the internet, they're not going to be placing the product into the walls perfectly so that it is in full contact with all six sides and that there's not gaps. You're going to have 4% gaps if you're, if you're lucky. You're going to have 10, 15, 20, 25% gaps in the wall structure. Okay, So that's the first major flaw that we've got with the fibrous system. The second is the whole entire air leakage issue because as soon as we allow the air to get past the polyvapor barrier and get into the wall, there's absolutely no impediment whatsoever. The fibrous or mineral fiber is just a filter at that point. It's going to slow it down, uh, but it's not going to stop it. It can't stop it, and the air is going to transmit through with its moisture through the wall, and it's going to find something. It's going to find a staple. It's going to find a nail. It's going to find a screw sticking through or just the freezing cold sheathing, and water vapor is going to condense. You've got enough cold water against a cold substrate, and it's below zero freezing point. You're going to freeze. You can have ice in the walls. So this brings a huge issue into the wall assembly. You've got air leakage. You've got imperfect installation. You've got more and more complex designs. You've got a problem. So as much as we've gone two inches deeper in our framing and we've added more insulation, we're not actually making giant leaps and bounds on a 2 by 6 framed structure being drastically warmer than a 2 by 4 and that is why when we come with just one inch or an inch and a half of closed cell spray foam into a 2 by 6 wall we dramatically change the game change the feel of the structure because for the first time ever you're truly being insulated and isolated from air and water movement and we're going to get into some pictures here and we're going to show you some real world results of what the air leakage is doing and how it's destroying the fiber system. We have to pick on the fiber system for a little bit here before we can get into understanding clearly why the spray foam is a total building envelope dominance product. Okay, what we're looking at here is a composite of a 2x6 wall, OSB sheeting, and they have, in the best case scenario, they have a wet wall, and in worst case scenario, they've got, as you can see here, ice. What went on with this structure to cause this was uh, not so much a failure of the vapor barrier itself, but a failure of the caulking and the tape. So we came in, we were contracted to spray foam the roof, which we did. He batted the walls. Uh, so he was getting ready to have the walls drywall. Drywall was delivered, but there had been uh, at least a five week delay from the time that it was batted and vapor barriered by professionals to the time that the sheetrock delivered and then they were getting ready to put the sheetrock up and they noticed water dripping out of the plates now it's obviously freezing outside it's cold outside the heat's turned on on inside the house you know the roof is spray foamed we're ready to go right 
and they got water. Where's the water coming from? So they called me out to help with the investigation because they were obviously concerned that maybe the spray foam had something to do with it. It had nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the fact that the caulking had started to dry out. It wasn't sticky any longer. It wasn't sticky around the electrical outlets. Like when you take an electrical outlet, uh, one of these plastic boxes, and you, you smudge a blackjack all around it, and then you you know stick the uh, poly up against it, well, you're relying 100% on the adhesion of that sticky goo. When there's no board, there's no board screwed and pressed up yet against it. So this gentleman is sitting there and the, and the tape is letting go in spots, uh, the tape isn't as sticky and the caulking isn't as sticky anymore and air, air's coming out. Now, to all of you that have told me with the flash and bat, which we're gonna get to in part four, they've said to me, oh, well, you know, hey, that's why we put the one inch of spray foam on. Uh-uh, guys, look how much air is flowing past a vapor barrier just through the seams goes right through the batting. So what's going to happen? How much airflow inside the house are you going to get through the fibrous product until it hits the spray foam? So the fibrous is just a big filter. So the vapor barrier is not stopping anything. It's not an air barrier anymore. The positive charge of air inside the house, because the house is under pressure, the furnace is running, natural gas is being burnt, air is being forced into the house, and the, the walls in essence are becoming pressurized, right? There's there's air pressure and air flow and the vapor air barrier has to hold it back and it can't. So the natural convective and forced air currents in the wall structure in the building are now getting past these fish mouths and all these areas where the poly isn't sealed anymore and it's going straight through the fiberglass effortlessly, effortlessly. And what's it doing? It's condensing on the wall. Here is a staple right here. Here's a staple. So this is typical stucco exterior has a wire lath system on the outside held on with staples the staples stick through in the osb they stick out at least three quarters of an inch if not an inch uh here's another here's a framing staple up in the corner here all of these areas had frost balls on them and were huge because metal is so highly conductive uh, of heat so you've got the batting which is now freezing and then tearing when you pull it away from the wall how do you get this dried out you pull all the poly down pull the batting out if the batting is not destroyed uh it can be put out in the sun or in the air and warmed up uh, i just throw it in the garbage can i wouldn't have been putting it in in the first place this whole decision was made based on money we provided a quote for the walls no too expensive well what do you think this cost you right well you know, you hammer down on the fiberglass guy and the poly guy, you make them come out and fix this for nothing. And that's what he did. He hammered down on them and said, your product has failed. Look what it's doing. Now, did the installation fail? Did, did the batten poly guy really screw up his job? Not really. It's a limitation of what the product is able to do. Why is the acoustical sealant and tape letting go? Is it bad? Yeah, it could be. We could argue that. We could argue that they had a bad batch of stuff. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But how many times is this happening behind the wall after the drywall is put in place? You don't know. You don't know. And if you have got OSB that has got a very high water vapor permeance rating, it can't dissipate. The water can't dissipate. There's too much water here. You're not going to be able to diffuse this out through the wall assembly, right? The only way you dry this up once the wall is in place is sunlight or it starts rotting things out. So the internal envelope has failed. And I mean, this is this is a modern, uh, this was a 2019 built house to the most modern code standard that we currently have. Uh, and it's absolutely utter rubbish. Like it's failing and it's not working. So air leakage is the problem. Whether you've got the seams done well or you riddle everything full of holes, we're going to get into that in part three. We're going to show you how uh, putting sheetrock up increases air leakage by 400% without penetrations and 600% with penetrations, 400% increase in air leakage. So you're going to be having this going on in the walls somewhere. We haven't even factored in lazy installation of the actual bat. So now let's shift gears and let's start applying the spray foam to these situations because I'll show you here. When you have metal in the walls, this is typical, okay? Here's a, here's a H clip to keep the sheeting square. 
because they're not using tongue and groove sheeting. So they don't want the sheeting uh, buckling and bowing in or bowing out at the seams because they're putting stuck on. All of these, fr all these staples here are from the wire lath. They're holding the wire lath up. Look where the water went from top down. It became more uh, dry uh, where there was less warm air convective current. So the hot air is, is flowing up. It's making the top half of a nine foot wall extremely wet. I'm taking this picture from down close to the floor level. I'm crouched down taking it. Here's a two by six. Here's a two by six. Here's bat that's still frozen to the wall that got ripped out or stayed behind when they ripped everything out. And they're trying to dry this out. So what, what's going to happen here? You're still going to have moisture on here if you have air leakage. You can dry this out, put the bat back in, put the vapor barrier back in, and hope to Betsy that you don't have this problem again. But I've just told you 400% air leakage rate uh, when you put the sheetrock up. So the sheetrock is going to let a certain amount of air leakage through 400% more than if it wasn't. So you're going to have air making it through the wall. Just now you're not seeing it and you're hoping that it's going to dissipate through uh, diffusion, really. But how much diffusion are you going to get when you've got low permeance exterior sheeting, you've got a building wrap on the outside of the building, and then you've got acrylic stucco. Now there's there's airspace in between all of that. That's not airtight and in tight intimate contact with the substrate, but still it's an impediment for diffusion. Uh, the number one way you'd, you'd dry this wall out fiberglass way is with sunlight. Get sunlight beating down on it and get this exterior sheeting as hot as possible and drive the moisture out of it. This to me, folks, I don't care what this costs. This is a failure of a very, very, very flawed system, a system that is akin to abacus and typewriter technology. Folks, if spray polyurethane foam insulation was the standard for 2x6 and then you came along with glass fiber insulation and tried to sell everybody on this cheaper product, you couldn't do it. You just couldn't do it. The, the industry issues that you would be encountering would run you right out of town in the span of less than five to ten years but since it is cheap and it's backed with huge lobbying for code compliance and it's and it's cheap and it's been it has been the established first to the dance product we're constantly up against this educational because i would say that most people are in denial about what is really going on in a wall assembly with fibrous insulation and mineral fiber too i mean don't get me wrong uh, a, a rock wool bat is better than glass fiber uh, because it's more dense. It takes a little bit longer to, for the air to get through it, but it's all the same. It's still using air to insulate with. It still can get wet and it still can have detrimental problems once it does get wet. In order for you to drastically change the outcome, you have got to change the medium material. You cannot continue whether you're putting dense pack cellulose in fiberglass batting or rock wool, you're still using carbon dioxide or, or oxygen to be held in suspension in the fibers. How dense you can hold it will determine just how easily of a convective current, but there is no impediment on a 9 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot wall. There's no impediment front to back, top to bottom. The greater that you have of temperature differential from inside to outside, whether it's hot on one side, or cold on the other, doesn't matter which. The greater the differential between in to out, the faster and more accelerated the convective air current is going to be within the wall assembly of dense pack cellulose, mineral fiber, wool, or, uh, rock wool, and glass fiber. Now, obviously, glass fiber is at the bottom of the scale, mineral fiber is in the middle, and dense pack cellulose is at the top of the scale. Dense pack cellulose is going to give you a more custom fit, but you have to deal with a binding agent to help with the settling issue, right? You can make an argument that BIBS is going to be blow in blanket system, B I B S, BIBS is going to be better for you. But at that point, if you are dancing around with your hand on my butt at the dance with BIBS, then we're going to make the move on spray foam anyhow because you want a custom installed spray applied uh, fit to the stud cavity, right? Like, I find that people, the only thing that stops them from switching their brain over to a different medium material initially is the psychological hurdle of the cost. 
But when they start to see the cost of the water damage, the fibrous installation, the cellulose installation, the custom fit, if you are going to spend $10,000 on a custom blown in cellulose or bib system, you're still just a tiny little bit better than if you had batted it. Like, oh, fine, you've got the the, the cellulose installed, but you're still using air to insulate. You're still using poly or a mesh system to hold it into place. You're still riddling it full of holes when you go and put the sheetrock up. So again, you have not advanced in 75 years. It's still just basically one generation better than what Owens Corning came up with in 1932. That's why I call it abacus and typewriter technology. You have not progressed into iPad, uh, iPhone technology yet. So what happens when we go with the spray polyurethane foam? Let's talk about closed cell. Closed cell is using 1.5 billion, million, 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 1.5 million cells per cubic inch of inert gas trapped in those cells. That's what's providing the insulating layer. So you do not have water going through the material. You do not have air going through the material, okay? It's physically impossible. You will not get air to go through it. You're putting on it on in a liquid state, the foam closed cell is rising 25 times what goes on in the liquid mass. So that rising factor, that expansion factor means that it's going to push onto all six sides. It's going to push forward, backward, up, top, down, right, all in the corners, right? So in a stud cavity, we now have intimate contact with the substrate. We have bonded contact with the substrate. We have bonded contact with the studs, right? And then from there, we are not letting air go through the product. We're not letting water go through the product. So the open-faced side, the side that faces the sheetrock, is not detrimental. It doesn't need to be in contact with the sheetrock because we don't have a convective air current or moisture drive rate through the actual closed cell foam that's going to pull its overall efficiency down. So now all we need to worry about is where we have seams in the wood. The, the stud bay is airtight, watertight. Can't get anything through it. So which is the next weakest link? Where's the building going to try to drive the water and the air through? It's going to try and do it through where wood meets wood. We seal that up with caulking. Now the fiberglass guys need to be doing that too. If they do not, they still have air coming through the wall. And a lot of them don't. I've been in homes, triples, quads, headers, no black caulking on them whatsoever. So air's coming through there and it can get behind the vapor barrier into the stud cavity and make that one of the coldest walls that you've ever experienced that quote unquote is insulated. So we put an acoustical sealant or a hybrid uh, silicone or like we're using the eco seal into the wall cavity to seal the joints and to keep the air from infiltration exfiltration right we want positive air pressure inside the building whether it's air conditioning or whether it's heating to not be pushing through to the outside likewise we don't want infiltration of air from wind load uh, outside and temperature differential leaking to the inside and thereby bringing uh, cold meeting hot condensing forming frost so closed cell foam are we needing to fill the wall cavity up no, definitely not. We've done a video on how much foam do we need. Three inches of closed cell foam holds in 90% of the heat. Four inches holds 92. Five inches holds 93. So why are we going to go and fill an entire 2 by 6 wall up uh, if we don't have to? We don't. If you're going to be dealing with open cell foam, yes, you're generally going to fill the cavity up or just fill. Uh, to overfill it and to shave it flush is to be extremely wasteful. So they will try to fill the cavity just to the five inch mark, five and a half inch mark, just kiss up to it, shave off the high spots. And then because you've opened the cell structure up and the, and the product itself at five and a half inches doesn't have the vapor permeance for the longevity of uh, vapor diffusion in the areas where you're requiring a vapor barrier, you're gonna still put up the six mil polyethylene, but it's not the same as cellulose. It's not the same as mineral fiber because you can't drive a breeze a wind pressure a wind load a heat load pressure inside the house you can't drive that up against fiber uh open cell and get the air to move through it to the opposite side and the convective air currents within the wall assembly are not going to be ultra detrimental now something about this wall 
current situation. This is what people talk to me about about flash and bat. They put one and a half, two inches of closed cell foam on, then they want to make up the quote unquote R value with the uh, fibrous material. Well, the fibrous material is going to flow so much air through it under air pressure with no vapor barrier inside the house. It's going to be enough air flowing through behind the drywall that it's just a sieve. It's just a sieve. So all of the weight of responsibility of insulation is on the two inches of closed cell foam. It's not actually on the fiber. If the fiber wasn't there, you really wouldn't notice much of a difference. I guarantee it. All right, because I've seen how much air flows through fibers in the field, and if it's not, if it's working that poorly in the field, what's it going to do for you thermally? So what we are doing with closed cell foam is we're not needing to deal with poly. We're not needing to worry about vapor drive. All we have to do is air seal the stud bay and air seal the perimeter edges of the dissimilar and joints of materials. So we do the, our caulking package, we do the closed cell foam in the middle, shave off the foam, and what do we do with the airspace? Nothing. On a, on a three inch application or a four inch application, you're having anywhere from two to one and a half inches of airspace in the wall. That allows you to run something if you ab absolutely have to, but no, there's no adverse convective current within there. It's warm, it's dry, it's isolated, it's not moving. Uh, the air isn't moving in the inside there and if you did need to run a wire or fish something through phone line Internet cable you can because you've got space in a 2 by 6 wall between the closed cell foam and The back of the drywall. This is the premier way to insulate and if you really want to get fancy with it You can go with some outboard insulation on the outside So I've had people that have got 2 by 6 or even 2 by 4 and they've gone and put one and a half or two inches of closed cell polystyrene on the outside of the structure, glued and screwed it. And then from there, we've matched uh, a downgraded amount of spray foam, closed cell foam on the inside. So if you've got two inches or an inch and a half outboard, then we only need an inch inboard. And it, collectively, we've got a sandwich panel, if you will, of all total rigid insulation. And so there's no air in the assembly, no air in the assembly on the outside, no air on the inside. And we've got foam on the outside, removing any thermal bridging. If you, if you want to get into that, I've, I've got a, a dedicated video on that. But I don't believe that the thermal bridging is quite the detrimental effect that we've given it on white paper. But you've eliminated that, warmed up your sheeting, warmed up your stud face, and now your closed cell foam on the inside is providing the extra top up, if you will, of insulation value and then you do your caulking air seal package on the inside to make sure that you don't have needless exfiltration of air. Here's an example of just some details. Uh, Demolec had actually, Huntsman had provided these. Um, we've been using a lot more of their product lately with some supply chain issues and just shows you how the closed cell foam would be applied and I just want to illustrate to those that maybe don't quite grasp what I'm saying. If you're this far in the video already, congratulations, I pat you on the back. Here is a, uh, an example of uh, rafter heel insulation. So you're going to blow in cellulose or something in the attic, but you want to stop the air penetration coming in right at the plate. That's an area that we do. Now, this shows closed cell foam on the outside. Imagine that you just do it in rigid, all right? Imagine that you use styrofoam. Like, I really don't like spraying externally just due to wind and overspray and the containment of it and trying to guess how many trips that we have to do so when it's outside of a building usually i'm going to encourage people to go with styrofoam one two inch or something like that and then you can downsize the amount of closed cell foam maybe to two inch uh or less inch and a half to two inch depending on how much you've offset it to the outside now because it's rigid outside rigid inside you do not need to be worrying about this um, vapor barrier potential issue the closed cell foam is your vapor barrier the closed cell foam on the outside not spray foam but uh, XPS extruded polystyrene you don't have a dew point issue within the wall assembly when you put rigid insulation to the outside and you've got screws and nails sticking through it's an absolute must that you go with closed cell foam I mean we saw fiberglass insulated structures that had styrofoam one and a half or one inch on the outside with all of the nails and the screws sticking through and they had huge water problems and it was all due to the nails 
uh, the air leakage was coming through even though they had rigid styrofoam on the outside the nails are what were getting cold enough to form the condensing point so this just shows you where you would be placing your spray foam uh, this could be again two inch thick three inch thick four inch thick whatever you want it to be this could be your outbound insulation and if you had no outboard uh, insulation on it uh, you just might up the value of the closed cell foam in the wall assembly floor joist assemblies showing you that you're coming over top of the foundation try not to leave the top of the foundations bare uh, get something on there. I know it can be really difficult to rotate and get the gun to spray down uh, And we're not always sticking a probe in up here We're not trying to get this the same value as we're trying to get here But you should try and get something roll your foam up over and then make sure you roll your foam all the way up to the top and and get any uh, plywood connections uh, Or blocking connections at the top sealed foundation. It's showing the same thing. This shows under slab uh, this shows how it could be concrete, this could be a crawl space, this could be a full foot, eight foot basement. Um, you decide. Um, framed or unframed, you can do the spray foam and then and then the framing. But we're concentrating right now on some wall assemblies, so I'm going to go to a wall detail. Just switched over to uh, BSF uh, 3D isometric detail because I... I think it shows just a little bit better here, and I'm just going to try and wrap this up. Um, you know, you you could be three inches of closed cell foam here. You could be, that's when this was written, three inches. You could be three, you could be four. Uh, you could be two. If you want to put some rigid insulation on the outside, you could be two. And then what they're trying to show you here is the caulking that is going to be going into the uh, double and triple joints. Uh, and then the bottom plate and of course this would be the same if you had uh, a, where the double top plate is for the top of the walls um, when you have got your closed cell foam into the wall assembly uh, the air is going to try to drive through the joints and that's the point of acceleration actually because it's so airtight in the middle that it just whoosh all this pressure is going to these one weak areas which are the seams so a really good sealant uh, that is rated to 20 years or something like that like a really good product don't cheap out on this don't go with something that's just three dollar tubes of junk like you really want to get a good product that's why we're using the eco seal but I mean a really good uh, polyurethane caulking and then press it into the joint and then flatten it out with a putty knife uh, so it's not interfering with the drywallers that's a really good way to go and then you've got a complete air seal package in Canada now uh, we have something called the wall energy rating and a uh, they have to do a deduction for the studs so sometimes when you're doing a 16 on center uh, they give more deductions for this so more insulation has to be increased so we're usually seeing anywhere from three to four inches of closed cell foam to make up for what this new code compliance is saying the studs are doing when there's no outbound insulation uh, we have done a couple of two by six walls that have a two by four staggered stud wall to those that are asking uh, it's it's more rare um, I've probably in 17 years of business done four of them um, just because people generally don't think in line with that that that's what they want but for those that don't understand, you lay down a 2x6 top and bottom plate and then you use 2x4s staggered so that no one stud is directly connected to the outside. So you have your outbound studs that are holding up the exterior sheeting and then your inbound studs uh, jogged inward on this plate. Um, it's okay. It's a good method. Uh, I don't know if it's really worth doing with some of the other technology now that's, that's out there. Uh, I think that you could make the argument that getting some inexpensive extruded polystyrene on the outside would be a good way to go, but some siding people don't like to have one and a half inches of uh, polystyrene on the outside. So if you're not doing an insulated exterior finishing system, EFIS, uh, uh, maybe you want to go with a, a zip wall, a Huber zip wall system, and that's, that's a really good method. I've got a house coming up here in the springtime that we'll be doing that's going to be receiving one inch of zip wall exterior sheeting and then we're doing uh, I think it's a three inch application of closed cell foam on the inside 
So they want to have a super great insulated wall assembly, and they're going to have it. Um, and that's that's a really good method to go. I think the the zip insulated exterior sheathing system, where you have you have a sandwich panel of uh, OSB urethane foam and then OSB, so you can choose any type of exterior siding product, and you've got a solid substrate and a solid backer to screw to. And then you've got an insulated exterior wall, and then you go and build up your air seal and your insulation with closed cell foam on the inside. I think I think it's a fabulous system. It's probably even more economical and easier to build with than um, doing something with, say, like a, an insulated stud system. Now, I've seen the T stud, and I've seen the insulated R stud, and everything. I think they're great. They're fabulous. It's just it's supply. How much can you get? Is it practical to build one house this way, custom build, or are you building 10 houses or 70 houses or 700 houses a year? You really have to take a look at what your project dictates. As a guy that, that sprays a lot of buildings in a year, from agricultural shops um, to houses, I would say the most common is that people are framing with 2x6 wall, usually 16 on center, uh, sometimes 24 if we're doing a bungalow, if they're doing a bungalow. And they're usually opting for somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four inches of closed cell foam in the outside walls. Uh, whether we do or don't do roof assemblies or if they blow them in or want to do something else. Um, that is probably the most common. I don't see a lot of people coming to us that want ex exterior insulation, although some of them do. When they do, we try to talk them into doing a little less foam that they don't have to pay for insulation twice. And uh, I'll tell you, when they're properly installed, uh, closed cell foam systems, these homes are incredibly low uh, consumption rates. They're very warm, they're very dry. I haven't had anybody yet that's really come back that's of sound mind and body and complained about what they are receiving. I think the, the probably the future to go in residential wood frame construction and light commercial is probably to go with standard frame construction and maybe incorporate a little bit of the the zip insulated sheeting because uh, it leaves you with the most flexibility to change things on the fly uh, when you go with prefabricated panels or complicated products that you can't get readily easily to site uh, then it just makes making changes and making modifications more difficult it makes doing oddball things like turrets or uh, larger cantilevered sections, just more complex designs in the architecture, more difficult. The advantage with the closed cell foam is that no matter how complex things get, generally speaking, as long as they've left us a path to get the insulation into the assembly, we can get it well sealed up. Uh, you add to that a really good caulking package to the interior side, and I would, I would venture to say that most exterior siding guys are starting to figure out that they need to do a better air seal and water and vapor seal to the outside as well. So you combine those three things, a really good exterior envelope of air and water sealing, really good insulation in the stud cavity with a closed cell foam, and then a really good uh, internal air seal package. Boom, you've got a wall that is gonna go 100 to 200 years. And it's probably the most cost effective economical system out of structural support, settling, twisting, torsion strength. We're gonna get in all that in video number three we're going to get into the air leakage nerdy stuff in video number three and i think you'll really enjoy seeing where the the facts and the figures go for the wall assemblies and the thermals to boot so we'll cut this video off here it's long enough already we've shown you how the foam works we've shown you how to place it in we've shown you the problems that you get with the fibrous system and how the closed cell foam system and even the open cell foam system eliminates all of that you don't have air moving through the wall you don't have a condensing point um, and if you eliminate air and eliminate water in the wall then you've got a wall that's going to last uh, lifetimes so thanks for subscribing we'll catch you on um, number three and leave a comment let's see what we have coming up